Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Carolyn Ward. I'm the CEO of the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation. And welcome to this month's edition of the Insiders Report. A couple housekeeping things before we get started. If you move your mouse over your screen down at the bottom, you will see a Q&A icon. Please feel free to click that and submit questions throughout the presentation, and we will get to as many of those at the end as we can. There is also an icon down there that says transcript. You can click that to uh, have a closed caption um, of the presentation. You can move it around your screen anywhere you'd like, or you can turn it off. So once again, please feel free to submit questions anytime during the presentation. And we will record this and make it available on our YouTube channel. And if you signed up for the webinar, you will receive an email with that recording a couple days after the presentation. So once again, welcome to this month's edition of the Insiders Report. And we're joined today by Jordan Calloway. She's the Chief Development Officer for the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation. And in honor of Women's History Month, we're going to explore some of the life and achievements of Bertha Cohn. You know, although the beautiful country estate on the parkway for Moses H. Cohn Memorial Park, the textile magnate's wife Bertha lived and managed the estate for far longer than her husband did. Bertha oversaw the 3,500 estate for nearly 40 years after Moses' death in 1908. She also had great contributions to the work uh, in the area in education. She served as a trustee for Appalachian Training School, which was later known as Appalachian State University. And she has had great achievements and successes both in education and the work on the estate. So we're gonna learn a lot more about that from Jordan today. So once again, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Jordan? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the introduction and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off so we'll be able to focus on the visuals today. So today I want to share information with you about Bertha Lindell Cohn. This is an often unheralded figure in the history of the North Carolina high country. Mrs. Cohn's estate is now one of the most visited spots on the Blue Ridge Parkway welcoming nearly 250,000 guests each year. Before it became a national park, it was her home. Bertha Cohn managed the estate for nearly four decades after Moses Cohn's death. At Mrs. Cohn's request, the country estate was renamed Moses H. Cohn Memorial Park. This was to commemorate the memory of her husband, Moses Cohn, the textile magnet. Her intent was to ensure that his blessed memory lived on. As a result, many refer to the estate and the manor house simply as the Moses Cone Estate or Moses Cone Manor. As a matter of fact, a comment just this month on a virtual tour that I created and shared noted that the viewer had always heard it called Moses Cone Manor, and they were surprised to learn that the house had another name. It was indeed Flat Top Manor and they referred to their orchards as Flat Top Manor Orchards, and it was Flat Top Estate, as you can see from this stationery from the period. So this is how Bertha Cohn is often remembered. She's usually uh, seen dressed very conservatively. She identified as a widow for the majority of her life. And much has been written about Mrs. Cohn, which is based on interviews with her young relations such as great nephews or great nieces, so people much younger than her. Her nephew Alfred would later write that in appearance, she was lovely, but in an opinion, inflexible. The recollections of young relations have impacted her reputation historically. It's important to note the age difference and that these memories were coming from people who knew her as an elderly, inflexible, widowed aunt. This is in contrast to how her husband was remembered, as a robust, successful young businessman. While Bertha Cohn's goal was to keep the memory of her husband alive, and she was quite successful at this, she managed to make his name and reputation tied to the estate and the hospital forever. But I think it's important to expand on the story of Bertha Cohn, who was in many ways the primary reason we are all able to enjoy the estate today. 
Her care and dedication of this property is why it still stands. So this is young Bertha Cohn, the one that you don't know as well. This shows her right before her marriage to Moses Cohn. How did this young woman from Baltimore come to become eternally tied to the North Carolina high country? And how did her desire to honor her husband result in a legacy of service for the last 75 years? To understand her life and legacy, we need to go back. We need to see where they came from before they arrived in the North Carolina high country. So like her future husband, Moses Cohn, Bertha came from a large German Jewish family. Her family settled in the Baltimore area like the Cones did. Due to its location as a port, Baltimore grew exponentially in the 19th century. It was the second largest city in the United States as of 1850. Moses's father, Herman, was an immigrant who first came to Virginia and then ultimately found success in Baltimore. Following Moses' lead, many of the Cones and Lindows would later make their way to North Carolina, drawn by the opportunities the state could provide. As historian Leonard Rogoff has pointed out, Few and mobile with Northern ties and German roots, North Carolina Jews lived in many worlds. Bertha and Moses definitely lived in many worlds, but they came from the same one. So they were each the eldest in a large family, as I mentioned. This photo shows Bertha with two of her, her two sisters who were her two closest companions. They were both the eldest in their families. They were both leaders in their families, and in many ways, they steered the course for the rest of their siblings. Moses' impact on his siblings' future has been well documented. Less has been noted on how Bertha Lindau impacted her siblings and future generations. And I love this photo because it shows Bertha with her two sisters, and if you're able to see their hats in particular, you can see that Bertha is the most fashionable one on the far right. Her sister Sophie is in the middle, and then her sister Clem is on the far left. So how might Bertha's life have been different if she'd been offered the same opportunities as women younger than her? How did her life differ from women who chose a different course in life, such as her unmarried sisters and her unmarried sisters-in-law, the famous Cone sisters? Bertha has often been described as very sharp, she was intelligent, she had a head for numbers, and she excelled at management. Unfortunately, college was not part of her course in life. If she was a female, or excuse me, if she was a male, she may have ended up one of the Cone executives. This photo shows a grouping of Cone export and commission employees. She definitely had a head for business. However, as she did not attend college, like her sister-in-law, Clarabel Cohn, she had a different course in life. Dr. Clarabel Cohn attended the Women's Medical College of Baltimore. This was a rarity, for, of course, for its time. Very few women went to college, and if they did, they usually attended single-sex institutions. Dr. Cohn did things that many people didn't do. <laughs> Bertha Cohn, according to her nephew, Alfred Lindahl, always wished she'd been able to attend college. For reference, Alfred, Alfred attended UNC and Harvard Law School and later served at a judge, as a judge. And this was all with the support of Bertha Cohn. She financed the education of all of her nieces and nephews. Moses Cohn was undoubtedly drawn to Bertha Lindahl for her intellect, as well as her looks. She ran in the same social circles as he did and attended the same religious services as his family. They had a four year courtship and were married the day after Valentine's. The ceremony was officiated by Rabbi Benjamin Zold, an important leader in the Jewish community of Baltimore. His daughter was Henrietta Zold, the founder of Hadassah. They were married in 1888 and within four years were accumulating property in Blowing Rock. So the creation of their flat top estate consumed much of their marriage. This was not an afterthought or a late in life decision as it's often been presented. This was not a retirement home. This is the permanent address they listed on their passport applications and this was truly their home. Although they were not able to spend 12 months a year at the home due to the weather in the mountains. 
and their business obligations elsewhere. They had no children and other than attending to their social obligations and the care of family, this was their personal focus. As has been well documented, Mr. Cohn devoted much of his energy to the development of his apple orchards. There's more on this later, but it was Mrs. Cohn who shepherded these fruits in later decades. After two years of construction, they completed the house in 1901. If you're interested in learning more about the history of the home, I highly recommend reading Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation advisor and former MPS interpreter Phil Noblet's book on the subject. At Flat Top, the Cones welcomed dignitaries and family friends in the few years after construction, hosting large dinner parties and extended stays of Cone relations. Etta Cone brought her, her friend Gertrude Stein to visit the estate in 1904. And this postcard, um, which you may have seen before if you've seen any references to the home, was actually mailed by Etta Cone to Gertrude and it survives in Gertrude Stein's papers at Yale. And I think it's amazing to think that you could send a postcard with a picture of your brother's house on it to your friend. So Bertha and Moses' shared time at the Cone estate was short-lived for they spent a large chunk of this time on a round the world trip with Moses' sisters. The famous Cohn sisters were well known for their travels, but Bertha spent less time overseas due to her stateside obligations. She was multilingual, speaking and reading her parents' native German, and she enjoyed reading in French as evidenced by her library collection. She also had a preference for French cooking based on the recollections of her grandnieces. In part due to the strain of overseeing his textile empire, Moses Cohn's health began to fail in 1908, and he died unexpectedly in December of that year. At his request, he was brought home to Flat Top to be buried. So Bertha Cohn was left to manage the estate on her own. She certainly had the support of her extended family. Mr. Cohn was the eldest of 13, and many of them summered nearby. But she was a Jewish woman from a metropolitan city living in an Appalachian community and lacked the sense of community she may have felt if she'd lived in a city like Baltimore or Greensboro year round. Luckily, she was able to visit these areas and maintain her connections through letters. She did have good friends and neighbors in the resort community, such as the Stringfellows and the Cannons that she was able to socialize with. Bertha Cohn enjoyed the kinship of Moses Cohn's three sisters, her sisters-in-law, especially Etta, who's seen on the far, far right. Etta was by her side for many months after Moses Cohn passed, but the three sisters had their own interests and obligations. Carrie Cohn would become a leader in the Jewish women's community of Asheville. And of course, you know all about the Cohn sisters and their art collecting. Bertha felt a tremendous responsibility for her own sisters and for her own family members. Her two sisters never married, and they spent time with her each year at Flat Top. This photo here shows them on the right, dressed in their Sunday best. It's an older photo, so it's hard to see, but they're wearing white gowns, which they wore on Sundays. Her sisters had health issues that required additional care. Her sister Sophie, who's seen on the far right in the photo of them as older women on the porch of Flat Top, was the more energetic and outgoing of the sisters, and she enjoyed having company over to Flat Top. While Jewish, she also attended the Episcopal Church in Blowing Rock so she could be part of a church community. It was not just her own generation that Bertha Cohn cared for, but for the first few years after Moses' passing, she also spent extended time caring for her ailing mother in Baltimore. She felt a financial responsibility for her family. Favorite references from the time. She also helped her family members find employment with the Cohn family business. As her nephew, nephew Alfred Lindau has pointed out, she was in very close contact with the Cones, but she was extraordinarily loyal to her own family, the Lindaus. She was especially devoted to her nephew, Norman. This is Alfred's brother. Norman was raised by his grandmother and his aunts since moving to their home at the age of three. He's shown here uh, on the lawn of Flat Top Manor, right near the balustrade. 
This was a feature that Bertha Cohn added after Moses' death, and it is one feature we have yet to restore on the exterior. You can see in this photo, if you look close enough, that Norman is smoking. And this is something that Bertha frowned upon. No one else was allowed to smoke, but of course she would allow Norman to smoke inside. He was allowed to do things others were not. Much of the oral history on the estate is thanks is due in part to the great nieces, Judith and Nancy Lindell. These two ladies have passed away in recent years, but shared a tremendous amount of information with park re researchers. The foundation is happy to have been able to provide the support for the scholarship and research that encompassed the family. Bertha's focus was totally on the estate and the manor house. She did a tremendous job. She paid close attention to every detail and to be quote about everything in Flat Top Manor and was an immaculate housekeeper based on letters from her house guest, Gertrude Wheel. As Atticone noted in a letter to Clarabelle, it is remarkable to see how well Sister Bertha manages this place in every detail. She carefully noted every expense and the need of every person who came to visit. If she noticed her estate managers had mistallied any figures, she would quickly call them on it. She was unafraid to speak up in her business dealings. This photo shows some of Mrs. Cohn's business checks, which were written from the Bank of Blowing Rock. These are actually held in the Blue Ridge Parkway archives. I wish you could see the color better because they're a really lovely green, which is fitting. <laughs> Bertha Cohn demanded perfection and she expected her home to remain in pristine condition. When she was away for the season, she would send clear instructions for its off-season care. In one surviving letter, she reminds Mr. Moody to have the balustrades well whitewashed in her absence. I believe Mrs. Cohn would be pleased to see the house in its current condition after we've completed the tremendous exterior restoration thanks to foundation donors. After an initial period of despair after Mr. Cohn's 1908 death, Bertha Cohn initiated many improvements to the estate. She expanded the kitchen. She added the lawn balustrade, which we saw in that earlier photo. She added something called an, an apple railroad. This was basically a way of transporting the fruits so they could then reach trucks and be shipped on to customers. It was a way of moving the, uh, the apples around in the orchards. She also built the first grade A dairy in Watauga County. It provided milk for the Teachers Academy and she would also ship the milk to Baltimore. At Bass Lake, she added ornamental plantings and she installed Heart Pond. She also increased her land holdings by purchasing some land, which she would later give to her nephew, Norman. Bertha and Moses before her felt a tremendous responsibility to be charitable, to give of themselves to better their community. They followed the practice of Tikkun Olam, literally to repair the world which meant the practice of being charitable to help their local community and the larger world. For many of their extended Jewish family, this concept extended to social justice. While very generous, especially with her friends and family, Etta Cohn once noted that charity work was one of the few avenues open to her. She chose to take a different route as an art collector, which was an occupation she undertook with her sister, Clara Bell, and her friend Gertrude Stein. This is a well-documented subject we will not cover in depth today. If you're interested in learning more about the sisters and their, and their collecting, I highly recommend the book Collecting at Full Tilt by Nancy Ramage and Ellen Hirschland. They are descendants of Carrie Cohn. Nancy Ramage graciously came and lectured when we co-presented a program at Brahm a few years ago in conjunction with the Cohn exhibits, and I highly recommend her work. So Bertha Cohn provided for Jewish causes in her lifetime. The lives of European Jews were in peril at the advent of World War II, of which Mrs. Cohn was keenly aware. She made a significant gift to the Jewish Welfare Fund of Baltimore in her will. Etta did the same, although she gave to the fund's partner group, the Associated Jewish Charities of Baltimore. Bertha's sisters made similar bequests and their names are listed in contemporary annual reports. On a related note, the lived experience of Jewish women changed greatly 
during Bertha's lifetime, which was roughly the Civil War era through World War II. Women were provided separate services at Temple. Bertha's niece, Miriam Lindau, helped to change that in Greensboro in 1923. She demanded equal congregational membership. Many of the advances at this time were due to the ability of Jewish women to organize and unite for a common cause. Moses's niece, Edna, was a leader in the state. She helped found the North Carolina Association of Jewish Women. You can see their logo here on this slide. You can also see the founder of the group, Sarah Einstein Wheel, who was the aunt of Gertrude Wheel, friend and house guest of Bertha Cohn. Among the charter members of the North Carolina Association of Jewish Women were Laura Weil Cohn, shown on the right, who was the wife of Moses's brother, Julius, and Sarah Wheel, who I mentioned on the last slide. You can also see Gertrude Wheel on the far left. All four of these women are worthy of extensive discuss discussion and research for the impact they had on the state of North Carolina. Gertrude Wheel, as shown on the left, was an absolutely amazing person, and Bertha was captivated by her wit and intellect. She described Bertha as a breath of fresh air, and she brought a lot of liveliness to Flat Top Manor. She visited a few years after Moses Cohn's passing. Mrs. Cohn was continuing to suffer from his passing and was very depressed, but Gertrude Will greatly improved her attitude. All of these women were working for social change and in order to truly make an impact on society, they had to have the right to vote. You can see the photo in the middle, votes for women is on the banner across their chest. The 19th Amendment was not passed by Congress until Bertha was 61 years of age. She lived most of her life without this right. Her friend Gertrude Wheel helped form the North Carolina Equal Suffrage League. She was several years younger than Bertha, but she had the energy and connections to help lead these efforts. Once Bertha was given the right to vote, she used it. As a matter of fact, her nephew would later note that she often stayed in Blowing Rock late in the season, meaning as late as November, so she could vote in the election. Her permanent res residence, after all, was North Carolina. Mrs. Cohn tirelessly supported the estate and the four decades she managed it after Mr. Cohn's death, as they did during his lifetime. She continued the practice of allowing the community to visit the property and enjoy the trails. She did require prior permission to fish, even from family members, and she did not want anyone to hunt unless it was her staff helping to control attacks on her sheep. Automobiles were not allowed on her carriage trails unless it was her own chauffeur taking her for a drive. She brought in experts, including the state highway engineer to assess the driving roads on and around her property. She carefully managed the estate and her decades. Of One aspect of the estate that's not been widely discussed are the features built for the support of the tenant families in the local community. Up to 30 families resided on the estate to help care for their expansive orchards and gardens. By his death, Moses Cohn had planted over 30,000 apple trees and over 80 varieties. In this photo, you can see the orchards on the slope in the front right, and so they were visible from the porch of Flat Top. The orchards did not fully mature until after his death, and it was Bertha Cohn who realized their first fruits. She worked tirelessly to promote this endeavor. She also shared the fruits generously with friends and family. You can see on this slide where she's inviting the public to come in and uh, view apple demonstrations, and learn about apple grading, and she would also ship apples to friends and family. She shipped apples to uh, her sister-in-law, Etta Cohn, and she shared them with Henri Matisse. She felt like Mr. Cohn before her, that the local community would benefit from this new industry. Mrs. Cohn depended on her tenant workers to care for the orchards, and she, in turn, helped her tenant workers. Moses and Bertha rebuilt Sandy Flats School in 1905 on Shoals Mill Road. They provided the majority of the funds for the building and sold the three-acre tract to the county for $1. They also augmented the teacher's salaries, allowing them to have a nine-month term. By all accounts, it was a model rural, rural school. Many of the students were children of their tenant workers, so the school accommodated this need. 
Moses and Bertha were also the earliest supporters of Watauga Academy, which became the Appalachian Training School, which then became what we now know as Appalachian State University. This school has grown to nearly 20,000 students at this point. But by 1911, when it was still Appalachian Training School, Mrs. Cohn served on its executive committee. She took her husband's place as a leader for the school. So while women were not allowed to serve on public school boards as of 1911, she sort of made her way into this leadership position. She was the sole woman on the five person committee. School boards, public school boards after all, were an appointed post and without a vote, a woman could not hold this office. Her friend Gertrude Wheel helped fight for this option for women and it eventually became legal in 1915. This was a new era in the status of women in municipal government. Bertha Cohn continued to find ways to serve the high country community. She served on the committee that presented Watauga County's first county fair in 1912. She continued to keep the grounds of Flat Top open to the local community and lived the rest of her life with her Lindau family members and Cohn family members coming and enjoying, enjoying Flat Top Manor with her. She loved the estate and she preferred being there above all. It was her final resting place. Mr. and Mrs. Cohn and her two sisters are all buried at Flat Top. Bertha Cohn's final gifts and final legacy was to help others. She wished to provide proper medical care for her community. For the people of the high country, Mrs. Cohn left $10,000 for the Blowing Rock Hospital. In today's dollars, that equals $157,000. Through her planned gift to provide a hospital for the people of Greensboro, Mrs. Cohn gave the equivalent of $15 million in stock. This amount was confirmed by family members at the cornerstone ceremony for the long awaited hospital in 1950. She used her half of Mr. Cohn's estate to provide for this institution, which has now grown into Cohn Health. And I think we can all appreciate the legacy that she's left. The impact of the Cohn legacy on the high country and the triad is immeasurable, but these are two aspects that we can link to Bertha Cohn. Thanks to the tremendous support of the local community and the many donors to the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, Bertha Lindell Cohn's legacy is intact. The exterior of her beloved Flat Top Manor is now in pristine condition, thanks to a year long restoration of the exterior. And this is due to the dedicated support of donors and the National Park Service. There is always more to learn about the fascinating topics we've discussed today. I invite you to visit the estate this season to learn more. And I hope this presentation has given you a new appreciation for the woman whose name is not always referred to. But I think we can always agree that this grand estate enjoyed by thousands each year would not be possible without Bertha Lindalcone.